I'd like to do a really brief little synopsis once again on many of the salient points that I mentioned. And you know, they never taught me stuff like this in photography school, and it's not like the school that I went to was a slouch. I mean, it was the second biggest in the nation, although arguably that would have been Brooks out in California, but it was only second after Rochester Institute of Technology. And they just, why didn't they make things simple? I mean, uh, it's been four years at the University of Kentucky and two years at uh, photography school down in South Florida, well, Central Florida, and uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, more, the more classes I took, the more evident it became that those who can't teach, and uh, I don't know, maybe you could put that guilt on me as well, um, although mine is more now a lack of time than anything else. I mean, I'm so busy doing a lot of things, but the premise of this is, is that one of the things that will separate you out very quickly, and you know, there are some shortcuts in life, and when it comes to uh, advanced photography or professional photography, if you could take another point away from these videos, is if you can encapsulate some of the few things, as I've said, one of the things that makes, really the only thing that makes someone a professional photographer is an expert both in composition, which is either innate or, you know, it can be taught. But a lot of taught photographic skills, and some of the current best shooters in the world, while they're highly acclaimed, and I'm not putting them down, their work is derivative, which means that it's like, I've seen that shot before, so-and-so did it, all they did was change the background. It's the exact same shot. It means it's derivative. It's like someone who's went to a really, really good painter. You know, they've got great painting skills, but they have no mind of their own. And what they've done is they've blended certain breeds of, uh, of, uh, of paintings. And uh, they've, uh, they've made a lot of derivative work. And this isn't to downplay anybody's masterful skills. I mean, if you're getting paid and people love the work, so what, right? Ultimately, it kind of, you know, is always pecking you in the back of the head going, you know, I can do better. I've got the skills. So you have to have the compositional skills, which, you know, if you are taught those skills, you make them their own, but then you bring them to the next level, and so it becomes your own work. But this video is not about that, so let me be brief, which of course I've not done currently, is that as soon as, when it comes to light manipulation, two premises of professional, professional photography, compositional skills, either innate or taught, and secondly, um, master of light manipulation. And a lot of times, of course, you can't tell the sun what to do, you know how to capture it right, but you need to know about light transmission, intensity, dispersion, translucency, frequency. But you need to understand that what you're not, what you are doing and what you should be doing are two different things. We all walk around like this, okay? And we want to capture the moments like, oh, this is beautiful, it's a little dark, I'll add some fill flash, which is great, that's the next step up. But, you know, you own a, a thousand or multi-thousand dollar DSLR so that you can do things that you cannot see. And these are the pictures that just, they shock people, they wow them. I mean, if that means getting on your back and taking a translucent shot of a leaf looking up to the sun, or that means taking a macro shot that only would be the perspective of a caterpillar crawling along the dirt. It's like, wow, I've never seen that before. You know, you're exploring the various realms of photographic reality that either A, do not exist to the human eyes, or B, don't, are not normally seen or perceived by the human eyes. And that would be the macro photography, getting on your back, or getting in these unique spots at unique times of the day. And those are photographic opportunities. You're taking uh, expansion of the spectrum of opportunity of photography that other people do not take advantage. It's like click, click, click. Oh, it's beautiful shots. Yeah, it's great. We've all seen it before. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be creative. And what separates out, you know, a really good skill photographer from an advanced amateur and a professional is being able not only to take opportunistic shots of perspectives that other people are not things like, I'm not going to get down on my back and take a shot. It's like, well, I am, and that's what's going to make this a killer shot for my portfolio that's going to impress a wedding client. It's like, oh, this person really thinks outside of the box. You know, they're just not like, click, click. They're not taking pictures, they're creative. 
Um, as I was talking about before, macro photography. And was like, well, why do you need a macro lens at a wedding? Well, I gave you the reason why in several videos before. Thinking outside of the box. People love it. Why do you want a fisheye lens at a wedding? Well, I've told you why you need a fisheye lens. Well, not should have, but people love those shots. That is just like... What's the difference between lasagna and lasagna with the special sprinkles on top? It's like, well, they're both the same, so why do people love this one? Well, it's because I added some macro shots to my wedding, and I added a few fisheye shots, and they think my crap is awesome, and they're going to recommend me to everybody else. Okay, it's just that little bit of sprinkle. But additionally, and specifically so, as pertains to this video, is you need to start creating images instead of capturing moments. And I know I've talked about this before endlessly, but what do I mean? I mean, are you actually thinking about that? I mean, are you actually seeing into what your mind knows it can do with a scene versus what your eyes are telling you one thing about this photograph over here, okay? And that's a moment. Your eyes can only tell you the moment, but your mind can tell you the image that is possible, okay? Causation. Point of causation is here, not the reflected light that's created over there. That's a moment, and this is the image. The image begins up here. You manipulate the, the, the scene through your skills as a photographer. I mean, what ultimately do you see in this? I mean, this is what your eyes see, okay? But my brain knows that there's something there potentially that I could cause to have happen to change this photograph from something boring into something fat. Now it's not wanting to work for me. <laughs> I think you know what this device normally does. There we go. You're like, oh, really good analogy there, right? What you see, there's the moment. What your mind knows is there potentially, which is the image. What could be manifest out of that by your compositional skills? People are so afraid of flash photography. I don't know if you could try something really simple. I don't know if you have a speed light, but you have the ability to set uh, your, psych your, number, your uh, number of your uh, strobes, and you're able to set, uh, uh, set the duration of those uh, strobes through a hertz, certain hertz setting. And uh, ever thought about taking a shot completely in the dark and dangling something from a string and letting it swing, and then setting a hertz cycle on your flash? and then checking that, you'll get some of the most fascinating shots. How about someone running? It's like, oh, I'm going to increase the intensity, which I'm not going to do because it'll actually uh, make this uh, camera blur out due to the uh, flash strobe, but I'll actually uh, go in and I'll change the uh, cycle. I'll change it from one hertz, and then uh, I'm going to change this to six times, and have someone jump in a scene in complete darkness, like a trampoline. You get a little trampoline in your backyard, Okay, have somebody jump in the... I mean, your child, a single shot, open up the bulb on your camera. Open up the bulb on your camera, you know, just do a time exposure. And let me actually change the cycle. I'm going to do it four times at a cycle of three hertz. There we go. Okay. Have him jump again, except recompose. After he jumps the first time, Tilt your camera over a little bit so you capture more. Just think this is all part and parcel of the nature of understanding that all of these are just nothing other than paintbrushes for the back of your digital sensor. And before, I, I'm starting to sound like that old fart that I used to make fun of, but before it was so difficult to do this, not it was any more difficult to actually do it, but you had to check the it processed the film, you had to write down what you did, or at least remembered it, which you usually didn't. And experimentation was so hard, and you really don't have an excuse anymore for that, because you can immediately check on the back of your camera, it's like, well, I needed to do this a little bit more, I need to tweak that a little bit more, and it's just so easy to do now. It's so easy. Um, so one thing, most important thing, and what was meant to be a short video, <laughs> is, is that you please start thinking about creating images rather than capturing moments. There's a lot of beautiful stuff you see. Start thinking about panning. Why the hell does everything have to be in focus? You know, to hell with that. You know, why does everything have to be still? Stick it on bulb and actually tilt your camera on your tripod head. Oh, well, let's see what happens. You know, have someone jog with a speed light in their hand, or you can actually set speed lights along the walkway. 
just the, 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 the things that you could do are endless. Understanding your camera is a time machine. The potential of what you can achieve is so limitless and so easy to check that it, it's just mind-boggling. And, and people are just continuing, as they are want to do, of thinking that, well, you know, if I, if I don't have a certain shutter speed, the picture is going to be blurred. Well, so what? Some of those gorgeous pictures I've seen have blurred images. Why does everything have to be in focus? Why are you so worried about bokeh? I mean, you know, back in the day, we weren't talking about bokeh, 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 bokeh. Give it a rest. I mean, yeah, I understand what it is and why it's so lovely, especially for portraits, for, you know, for crying out loud. Start thinking about something else other than bokeh, or how sharp my lens is. Well, who cares if it's not sharp? Well, obviously that's important, but I mean, does everything have to be sharp? Of course, you can blur it in Photoshop, Things are a lot easier to do now, far, far easier to do now, but start thinking about creating images and the ways that you can create image. Okay, sharpness isn't everything, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with blur, okay? There, there, there's nothing wrong with time exposures, there's nothing wrong, you know, it's an artistic image you're either using to expand your portfolio and expand your horizons, but you need to start thinking up here about creating images instead of you know, your, your eyes are so worthless in photography. And this sounds superficially stupid, but it's so very true. Your eyes, the key thing, and that no one will tell you, and not because they don't want to tell you, they themselves don't know. Your eyeballs are so useless when it comes to advancing your skills in professional photography. What is important is your mind and knowing that if I change the characteristics of exposure, transmission, diffusion, reflectance, intensity, you know, I pan and tilt, out of focus, you know, stroboscopic shots at late at night, camera on a tripod, you know, what could I do? Rear curtain sink, front curtain sink, all of these things, you think, oh God, how do they take that picture? So, they're not that difficult. I mean, they aren't. Once you experiment with a few of them, and say you fight to get it right for 20 minutes. After you fought for 20 minutes with yourself, and you get it right, you've got it. It's like, okay, there's another one. And you, go, you do another one the next day, and then another one, another one. And then you start merging them, and you're like, holy crap, Bob was taking crappy pictures before, but now he's taking some amazing stuff. I think we're going to have him shoot our wedding. This stuff is killer. He's got these macro bug shots. He's got, uh, you know, sceneries reflected through water droplets sitting on the end of a leaf. He's got stroboscopic light painting shot. I have no idea how he made it, but it is just beautiful. We got to have him shoot our wedding, or we got to have him shoot your portrait. You know, uh, the person has mastered light. And mastering light is not about what your eyeballs are seeing. You know, well, I'm going to master the light by adjusting my aperture and my shutter speed, and I'm going to take the proper composition. That's amateur, that's amateur photography thinking. Professional photography thinking is seeing what is there, but not with your eyeballs, but with your mind. And this is where it, come in, it comes into the fact of creating an image versus capturing the moment. Thank you for indulging uh, my lip flapping there. And uh, sorry if I talked too long, but that really is a very succinct point to be made. And uh, 